It's lovely to be here. Before I started an apology, I was playing touch football on Sunday and I pulled a muscle in my back. So I'll, you'll, if I didn't tell you that, you'd think, gosh, he moves oddly. Because I'll be a bit like that. That's why I worked the chair there in case he gets too much. Um, I have three daughters. They're all at uh, the same public school, the Lara Public School in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. And I don't know what you know, your prejudices might be about the eastern suburbs of Sydney, but let me tell you, from, from living there for a while, and, and uh, there clearly is a very strong commitment to public education in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, right up to the end of year four, pretty much. Um, <laughs> and then they'll go to Skeggs and Cranbrook. Uh, I've also noticed that in the eastern suburbs of Sydney that, and this is from talking to parents, uh, that according to parents, this is from talking to uh, quite a lot of them, it seems that pretty much every single child in the eastern suburbs of Sydney is gifted and talented. Um, in fact, I was talking to one of the teachers at my kids' school the other day, and she, she said, if one more parent tells me their kid is gifted and talented, I'm going to punch them. <laughs> I, my own school, I went to school in Adelaide, I went to a single sex private school there called Mercedes College, and it was a single sex private school, but it was a girls school. And in my kindy year, they decided to go co ed, but only in kindy, right? And the idea being, as our kindy year made its way to year 12, by the time we were in year 12, the whole school would be co ed, um, which kind of made sense, but no one told all us boys in kindy. And all we knew was that everyone older than us was a girl, and for the whole of my kindy year, me and all the other boys just sort of at the end of the year something really dreadful was going to happen to us. <laughs> I remember saying to my friend Jonas, how are you feeling about becoming a woman? Um, and he didn't think he did life fully as a man yet. So, uh, so what I want to talk to you about this morning is innovation, about, about how it happens, about how we can all think of better ways of doing things and how we can create cultures in our organisations that encourage everyone to, to uh, think of making things better as their job and, and also allow us to get access to all their ideas. But first, let me go back. When I finished school, I went to university and I was at university for five years and I worked very hard in the second half of November of each of those years. <laughs> uh, when I finished uni, I uh, did a double degree, economics law, before I knew it, I'd become a corporate lawyer. And I absolutely hated it. I didn't like the work, I found the work culture terrible. You know, they worked such long hours that they thought the uh, great thing about weekends was that you could wear jeans to the office. Um, <laughs> I remember I had a boss who was like, um, you know, we were working late one night, he was like, oh, look, you finish it, you, you know, I'll finish it, you can go home, he's quite a good boss, and I was like, that's fine, he said, no, look, I'll finish all this, you go, and I was like, Christmas has never really been a big deal in our family. <laughs> and I realised I'd had tremendous educational advantages, uh, being the, the good schools, done well, university, double degree, did well, and I ended up in a career that I was unsuited for and that I found dispirited, and I saw it stretching out ahead of me for the next 30 or 40 years. What I did next changed my life, and I'll come back to what it was a little bit later on, but it, it, it led to me 10 years later working on ABC Local Radio and then getting a job uh, as host of the New Inventors on ABC Television. Um, and I didn't get the job because I was an expert at innovation, I didn't really understand what that meant, in fact I was slightly suspicious of the term. I remember around the time I got the job, we bought a new fridge and the guy said, oh, you should get this one. And I said, why? It's got this new innovation. He said, if you leave the door open, it beeps. And I said, it's so clever, why isn't this bloody all, uh, you know, shut? <laughs> get an office strap or something. But I very quickly, so on the new inventors, we had three Australian inventors on each week showing us and anyone who watched what they created. And I very quickly became aware of the remarkable things that people were creating around this country all the time. And I remember the one that really turned me on to how remarkable it was. Remember 10 years ago, everyone was really into the idea of saving water. You know, there was a drought everywhere, and even for people in cities, it was really front of mind. And yet every single day, we'd all turn on hot taps, and what would we do? Yeah, we'd wait. We'd watch the water go down the sink and go, nah. yeah, all right. We had an inventor on Good Lloyd Winston Smith, there he is, and he turned on a hot tap one day and he thought, well, I'm wasting water. And what he invented was a thermostat that goes in the tap. So when you turn on the hot tap, if it's below a certain temperature, it gets diverted off down a little pipe to a tank beneath the sink. So when you turn on the hot tap, nothing comes out. 
until there's hot water. And next time you turn on the cold tap, the cold water you just saved comes out of that. What I thought was remarkable about that invention was that 20 million of us every single day had been turning on hot taps, what, three or four times a day. And none of us had even seen that we were wasting water. None of us had even recognised that that was water we could save. But I wondered, how did Lloyd manage to see that? And why didn't I see that? And if I'm missing that opportunity for innovation right in front of my eyes, what else might I be missing? And more importantly, how can I learn to see it? And it was then that I began to think about what a remarkable force innovation is. Uh, innovation has given us everything that's person-made, hasn't it? Everything in this room, there's nothing natural, is there? In this room, it's taken us out of the caves and given us the safe, comfortable lives, relatively speaking, that we enjoy today. And of course, the pace of change today is faster than ever before, which is great and exciting because there's new stuff all the time. But it's also a little bit scary, isn't it? Because it means that no matter how well we've been doing things and how comfortable we are with that, if we keep doing it the same way, soon it's going to be outdated. In a very real sense, today's cutting edge best practice very quickly becomes tomorrow's fax machine. I mean, I'm, maybe most of you are older. Do you remember how cool fax machines were when they first came out in the early 80s? I thought they were freaking magic. Didn't you? They were just, I mean, even 15 years ago, that's where fax machines were. This is where they are now. When I talk to organisations about the motivation for innovation, it's pretty easy because I tell them that if they don't innovate, if they don't continually keep up, uh, keep coming up with better ways of doing things, they're going to be dead. They're going to be passed by. Um, they won't. Their, their, their business will fail. And of course, the motivation that isn't the motivation for you. You guys have pretty much got a monopoly on the whole public education thing. You're not going to be. Uh, uh, people who want to go to a, a, a public high school aren't going to go somewhere else because you're not being innovative. The motivation for you guys to keep coming up with better ways of doing things is more noble in a way, isn't it? It's to, it's to find better ways of educating Australia's children. And I don't really need to say anything more about that because that's a really important thing. Obviously, you know how important it is because you spend your lives doing it. And I think kind of everyone gets that innovation is important. You know, companies talk about it. Uh, there's articles about it in the paper all the time. It's in organisations' value statements. They have conferences about it all the time. And that's all great. But the problem is, as far as I can tell, is that no one actually tells you how to do it. You know, if you've been in a meeting where, where people go, you've got to think smarter. And you go, yeah. And then you go back to your desk and go, and yeah. Like, how? So what I decided to do on my eight years on the new inventors was try and work out how they did it. How pretty ordinary people like you and I managed to see things that I didn't see and come up with a better way of doing things. I wanted to see if there might be a process that they all went through, or many of them went through, maybe that they weren't even aware of, that would increase the chances that you get something new and better at the end. So that's what I want to share with you this morning. Before I do that, let me ask you a quick, quick question. I want you to put up your hand if you think you're capable of coming up with a cutting edge, brilliant idea that can improve the way your school uh, does things. Okay? About 10? That's good. That's good because, you know, this is Australia, no one likes someone who's up themselves. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of you think, oh, I want to put up my hand, but I don't want to do a dickhead, so what do I do? Well, let me tell you this. So I've probably met more innovators than anyone in the country, right? I reckon everyone who didn't put up their hand is wrong. Like from my observation, innovators, they're not smarter than the rest of us. They're not more creative than the rest of us. They don't have access to some special part of the brain that the rest of us don't have. And, and I was really surprised to make that observation. You know, sometimes I would meet an inventor who come up with something great, and I'd talk to them, and I'd say, are you sure it was you? You know, because they didn't seem that smart, but it was them. <laughs> What they do is a few things better than the rest of us. So let me tell you what the first one is. Now, I know what you're thinking. You think, what do you mean think? I spend all day thinking. That's why I'm so tired and crabby every day. But do you? How much of your day do you spend thinking? How much of it do you spend reacting, responding, 
coping, dealing with processes, dealing with parents, answering the phone, answering the other phone, reading emails from the department, drafting replies that say what you think they want you to say to the department without actually saying anything you don't want to say. Um, Go to meetings, go to more. How many of you get to the end of the day pretty regularly and think, I did not have a moment to think? Hands up. Pretty much everyone. Anyone never had those days? Not one person. Innovators, people who think of ways of doing things better, find time every single day to think about how to do things better. They treat it as important. They don't do it uh, uh, when you know everything else is done. They don't do it when they're tired. They just rope off maybe just 10 minutes a day and think, that is my time to think about improving things. I was doing a radio interview about this the other day and the guy said, you mean they're not very busy? And I said, no, they're busy. They just understand that innovation isn't what you do if you have time after you've finished work. It is the work. It is the work. So, Sorry, I say, yeah, think, blah, blah, blah. What do you think about? Where are the opportunities for innovation? Where are the opportunities to find a better way of doing things? Well, let me turn that around and ask you this. Where aren't they? Where isn't there an opportunity for innovation? And I guess the answer is when things are perfect, when we're utterly confident that the way we do things now is the way it's going to be done in 30 years, or 40 years, or 50 years. If you find something like that, don't bother think about thinking about how to how to do it better. I mean, probably, you know, the numerical system. That's been around for a couple of thousand years, one, two, three, four, etc. There's no end to it, that always confused me, but anyway. But I can't really think, I don't imagine that there's a way we can improve on that. You know, and you start counting in a different way. But there aren't many things that can't be improved upon. Um, the only other thing I could think of was, was this. <laughs> The taste of Vegemite. I know they tried to a couple of years ago with cheesy Vegemite or whatever or something. But I think if they tried to innovate on the taste of Vegemite, buy it, improve it, change it, anything they did would make it worse. Because I pretty much think it's perfect. But that doesn't mean there's no opportunities for innovation in the land of Vegemite. Innovation isn't just about the goods or services you supply. It's not just about the interaction between teachers and students. It's about every single thing in your organisation. Your systems, your processes, how you deal with suppliers, how you deal with parents, how you deal with each other. Every single thing. So this is what I would suggest you might want to do first. As you go through your day, just make a list of things you suspect might be able to be done better. I really hope you've picked up the deliberate typo in this. Or else our kids are going down in the tubes. <laughs> it's supposed to be a joke. Sometimes people laugh, you don't have to. Um, make a list of everything. As you go about, just a couple of hours each week, just say, okay, between now and midday, I'm just going to make a list of everything I suspect is not perfect. Just everything. I'm just going to make no, nothing. I'm not going to try and think of a solution. I'm just going to make a list. And then if, if, if you have a list, just take 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes each day, pick one of the things on your list and think about some ways to make it better. And what will happen then is you'll feel stupid and depressed. That's normal. Don't worry about it. Don't put too much pressure on yourself too early. You know, uh, American scientist Linus Pauling said, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. And if I can add something for that, the best way to have lots of ideas is to spend a bit of time trying to think of them. Yeah? So what do you do if you have ideas? Well, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I just want to talk about this process of thinking a bit. Because it's kind of a mysterious process that not many of us understand, and I just want to try and put some structure on it. So let me give you one more quotation. Habitual thinking is the enemy of innovation. Now you know what habitual thinking is, right? Habitual thinking is, you know when you start working at a new school, right? And the first uh, week, every time you drive to it, you go a different way because you want to find the quickest way. So on Monday you go this way, there's too many traffic lights. Tuesday you go that way, but there's a traffic jam, etc., etc. By the end of the week you've worked out what the quickest way is, and you drive that way to school every single day for the next 38 years. And you look at it like this guy. Now, look at this guy's eyes, right? He's not awake, he's not asleep. You know, he's doing a complex, important uh, uh, biomechanical task. He's driving a car. But look at his eyes, he's not really awake either. And every day, 
we go through habitual thinking. And of course we need processes and systems or else there's chaos, right? But we need to find ways of breaking out of habitual thinking, of doing, you know, when this happens, I do that. When this happens, I do that. We need to find ways of stepping back and breaking out of it. Because if we don't, we don't see the cold water we waste every time we turn on a hot tap. We just don't see it. So, I want to tell you some uh, strategies I've seen people use uh, for breaking out of habitual thinking. First one is to question everything. Who's used a wheelbarrow? Hands up. All right, who's paid someone to use a wheelbarrow for me? <laughs> when I said that to bankers the other day, they had one of them. Um, you wouldn't think you could make a better wheelbarrow, would you? Well, you know, the wheelbarrow is fairly well designed, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, it rests solidly. When you fill it up, that's not so bad. When you pick it up, it's very ergonomically balanced. But the worst part of using a wheelbarrow is kicking it out. That's its flaw. Because suddenly the whole weight comes onto your biceps, and because thanks to innovation we have safe and comfortable lives these days, most of us have inadequate biceps. You do that two or three times, it starts to happen. But the, but the wheelbarrow has been around for 1,800 years. Well, how could you be so audacious, really, as to question it? Well, this guy, his name is John Steeder, he's the set of the new inventors. He's a, he's a builder, he's never worn a suit before. That's his wheelbarrow. He put a hinge on the front and. Uh, Can I have a go? Yes, sir. Just a flick of the wrist, eh? That's the technique. Oh, excellent. Do you want to show us again? Just to say that is really out of it. It's just slowly. Yeah. What I love about that is that he didn't take the wheelbarrow for granted. And there's things in your school that you take for granted, ways of doing things that might have been there before you were there that you take for granted. Just question it. Maybe if you question 15 things, you'll decide that 14 of them are perfect, but maybe the 15th isn't, and maybe that's something where you can do things uh, a little bit better. Let me give you another example. In Philadelphia, in a high school in Philadelphia, the science teacher set his students a task. He said, I want you to think of a way to save this school money. It's a pretty good idea, right? 14-year-old Samir Merchandani realised that they got a lot of paper. You know, they got handouts in class, they got notes to take home, they got their homework on paper. And he knew they used recycled paper and they printed on both sides. But he thought about the printing, the ink costs. And what he did was to write 100 words, right, and put it on four, four different documents. And then change the font in each document. Print them all out and wave it. So one was Times New Roman and there the other three. And so the pieces of paper weighed exactly the same. Any difference in the weight was due to the different amount of ink used. He found that if his school changed all their printing so that they used Garamond font, it would save 24% of their ink bills, $21,000 a year. By changing font. And if the US government printed all their documents in Garamond, they would save $370 million a year, which would allow them to buy half a new fighter jet or something. <laughs> Questioning the font. It's a great example, isn't it, of things being right there before us, us not even thinking about them. And how easy was the solution to implement? Or you do is select a different font. We make assumptions all the time, and sometimes we need to. But sometimes those assumptions, if we question us, it can lead us somewhere. So let's talk about in-flight entertainment. In the old days, there used to be a shared screen, didn't there? Now, then there was a screen uh, in the seat in front of you. Now, sometimes they give you a device. Presumably before screens, they used to do live shows in the or something like that. <laughs> but the assumptions always been, up until recently, that if you want to watch the airline's content, you do it on the airline's device. Well, IBM worked with Air Canada, and they questioned that assumption because they realised everyone was bringing their own device on the planes now, pretty much everyone. They said, why don't we just design an app, they can download it before the plane uh, uh, takes off, then they can watch our content on their device. So they did that and enabled them to save the cost 
of all the screens. It enabled them to save maintaining and install the cost of maintaining and installing uh, all the screens. And it also enabled them to the planes to weigh 250 or whatever screens lighter, so it saved a little bit of fuel. But all from questioning that assumption that had been underlying everything that no one had really even thought about. Questioning the assumption that you watch their content on their device. One of the assumptions I think we make a lot these days is that technology is the answer. And often it is. But sometimes we sit back and say, oh, well, I'm sure there'll be an app or a device or something for that. It's not always the answer. Let me give you an example. Ed Evans was a cattle farmer, and he knew that, you know, in cattle races, they have a, 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 like a, a race in a yard, and a race in a yard, there's lots of cows in them, they're all moving through. What's the farmer always told? Never turn your back on the gate, right? You might have forgotten to lock it, and a cow might kick it, or a cow might charge it. And they all know that, but they all sometimes turn their backs on the gate because something's happening over there and something's happening over there. And every year in Australia, cattle farmers are seriously injured, sometimes even killed, by a cow charging a gate and back. The gate going to smash. Ed Evans wanted to solve that problem. A friend of his had been seriously injured. So he could have waited for technology to find the answer to him. He could have waited for maybe, you know, an alarm that would sound if there was a cow within three metres or, uh, you know, some special self-locking thing that would be easy to unlock or even some sophisticated technological thing where a human hand could open it but a, but a, 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 a contact with a cow wouldn't. Well, this was uh, Ed's solution. So that's Ed. That isn't the cow between Ed and me. That's a fairly poor impression of a cow. But that's a team for these two You'll see a bird's eye view in a moment. And, uh, well, this was his invention. Quite nervous, Ed. Yeah, so you're ready? In fact, quite nervous. But yes. All right. What's in here? So even if I'd been down in the middle, Rather than up one end, the gate might have just grazed it. And even if I'd been right down that end, it might have hurt a little bit. But the breaking of the gate in the middle takes all the force. So Ed's innovation was a hinge in the middle of the gate. The hinge was invented 4000 BC. That problem's been around for 200 years. Technology wasn't the problem. It was thinking. Anyone could have invented that any time in the last... 200 years. So don't sit back and wait for technology. Another example, we were out to dinner last night. The waiter took our order on iPad, took a little bit longer than a normal order, but that was okay, good on him. I watched him. He walked over to the kitchen and then read the order off the iPad <laughs> as the chef looked around for some scrap of paper and scribbled it, <laughs> scribbled it down. My oldest daughter was in year six, so she's going to high school next year. We're looking around. We went to a private school to have a look around, and they very proudly told us about how every student had a tablet. And I was waiting for the headmaster to tell us why that was good, but she didn't. She thought that was the end, that was, they've all got a tablet. And it just made it re me really aware that having a tablet isn't a solution to anything, is it? It's only a solution if it enhances your educational outcome, if it allows you to do things quicker or more efficiently or better than you could do before or things you couldn't do. She didn't tell us any of that. She said they got a tablet. And it reminded me of when Kevin Rudd was talking about, you know, by 2000 and whatever, every high school student will have a computer. And I remember at that time that, that no one said why. And of course, the, the, the answer is in some ways self-evident, but no one said, how is that going to make things better? And I'm sure there would have been a great answer to that. I can think of any ways in which high school students having computers makes things better. But it just seemed that everyone was thinking, Right, if they've got a computer, we all live happily ever after. You know, it's like swapping over from pencils to pens in a more sophisticated level. It's just a tool. It, it's not the answer, it's a way to get to the answer. It's, it's the means. So technology by itself is not the complete solution to anything. Sometimes the solution is right in front of our eyes. We just have to go through a process of, of accumulating and analysing data to get to it. So a zoo in America knew there was a relationship between the weather and how many people came in, right? Obvious. They also knew that the more people who came into their zoo, the more staff they needed. They also knew that 65% of their costs were on staff. But they, the, the, the relationship between the weather and how, no one quite knew it exactly. So they couldn't rely on it. 
So they went through quite a sophisticated exercise of crunching the data, you know, taking into account school holidays, weekends, public holidays, what was the weather, did it rain, how hot was it, da, da. and they came up with, at the end of it, a relationship, almost a formula, which meant on Monday they could roster accurately within a margin for error for the whole week based on the weather forecast. So they, if they knew on Wednesday it was going to be fine, they'd put 100 people on, Thursday it's going to rain 40 people on, and Friday, they, if it was going to be sunny in the morning, rain in the Arvo, put a whole lot of people on, rost until midday, less in the afternoon. It saved them lots and lots of money and that they freed up to, you know, be able to spend on more beds or whatever it's in it is for myself. So um, but, it's, you know, maybe there is data in your organisation, maybe it's very easy for you to get data from students about things you can analyse and then... And, 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 and then use the conclusions to use resources more efficiently to find out what students need and want and uh, and and supply it. The last thing, the last sort of strategy for breaking out of habitual thinking, think like a customer. And your customers are obviously your students. You probably think they're the parents, or well, the parents probably think um, they're the customers. But it's really the students, isn't it? Uh, and I think it's really important. A friend of mine owns a bookshop, and every Tuesday he lets his staff open up, and he goes into his own shop, and he, he goes shopping in his own shop. Right? He goes looking for books as a customer. He says every single time he sees something different, he sees some little opportunity to make the layout of his store better, he sees something that's not quite in the right place, that he didn't see the rest of the week because he's in a different mindset. He's trying to be his customer. I met the head of supermarkets for Woolworths and he said he goes into his um, customers' houses and looks in their cupboards, looks in their fridge for insights into how they shop. I presume with their permission, uh, I don't think he <laughs> goes around breaking in and then he goes shopping with them. So a real commitment to thinking like, like a customer. How would you do that? Let me give you an example. I want to talk about boredom. One of the things I remember about school is being bored sometimes. And my kids, so I got three kids in uh, year one, three, and six, and they never say they hate school. There's never anything they really hate. But they do talk about being bored sometimes. And I kind of figure if students are bored, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, you're not achieving. Yeah? And, and, and the boredom is something, I, I mean, boredom is pretty much the thing I hate most in my life. Um, and, and, you know, and it just seems that when I was at school, that was a, a large chunk of it. I've tried to eliminate it since then. But it would be great to go through a process of trying to identify boredom, where boredom happens in your schools, and eliminate it. So think like a customer, how do you do that? Well, you know, maybe if, when you have assemblies, you might find them quite interesting because you're probably involved. You're probably getting up and talking and doing things and da da da, seeing high achievers in the school. Next time you have an assembly, go and sit in the crowd up the back. Find out if you get a bit bored. Find out if people around you are a bit bored. If they are, fix it. Make the assembly shorter. Make it more entertaining. Work out what's going on and fix it. In classrooms, people are bored, aren't they, sometimes? You know, it occurred to me as I was flying out, I am really accountable to you for what happens in this hour, and I'm sure there's a way for you to get feedback, either formally or informally, about whether this session was good or whether it wasn't. And, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, and neither would the organisers, because next year they want to make the conference even better. Students are really accountable to teachers, aren't they? But homework, why aren't you here, da da da, they're accountable several times a day to teachers. I don't know if teachers are that accountable to students. I ask my kids, do you ever get a chance to like, give feedback on your teachers, like at the end of the year? No. I thought, if you want to find out whether kids are getting bored in the teacher's class, how do you do it? There's only two ways. I think you go and sit in the class and work it out for yourself. You can't ask the teacher, they're not going to get it. Yeah, I'm bored than these. Um, but you either go and sit in the class or you ask the students. And I just wonder why, I mean, you know, I can imagine asking the students might be a can of worms, but if you have a, a simple questionnaire, how often are you bored in this class? Never, sometimes a lot. And you have one teacher who's getting a lot of a lots, that's a pretty that's a big red flag, isn't it? And it's something you can work with them to improve. But you have an enormous amount of information at your disposal on every single teacher. But do you get it? Do you get access to it? How useful would that would that be? Just a thought, probably a million regulations preventing them doing it, but 
But, but do you something about the boredom thing? I reckon. Like, I mean, you know, if you spend a year being bored out of six, that's bad. It makes school a year less. Well, that's what you have to do. The last thing I'll say about thinking is this. So, do you think it, I mean, do you think that we should do more? You know, does what I say make sense that we should spend? Yes? Look at all the answers, right? So, why don't we? Anyone? Why don't we? Too busy? Too lazy? Yeah. I think one of the other reasons is that it's really hard. Like it is. Like if you, if you do what that guy at the conference said and you notice things that might not be perfect and you write them all down and you write one at the top of a blank piece of paper and you think about it, what's there a manager? A blank piece of paper. And blank pieces of paper are pretty intimidating, right? Like we don't get many blank pieces of paper in our lives these days. We usually get pieces of paper or electronic pieces of paper with like 38 things that we have to do on it. If you go through this process and you look at the blank piece of paper and you feel stupid and you feel frustrated and you feel like, i got nothing, that's okay. That's how you're supposed to feel. That means you're doing it right. Everyone feels like that when they're trying to think of new ways of doing things. I said that innovators weren't cleverer or more creative than the rest of us, but they are a bit more bloody minded. They will sit in that uncomfortable space feeling like they're lost for a bit longer than the rest of us. And eventually they'll come up with something. And it might not be the best thing, but they'll come up with something. And then they might come up with something else and eventually they'll come up with something they can use. Some new research out of England recently said that if you go through a period of boredom and frustration and you persist, you're more likely to be rewarded with a period of enhanced creative thought. I'm trying to write a, uh, I'm, I, I write kids' books now. And I'm writing one at the moment. And I'm up to page 144, that's all right, right? But on the plane, uh, back to Sydney in the suburb, I'm going to look at page 145, and it's going to be blank. And I'm going to feel stupid, and I'm going to feel frustrated, and I'm not going to know what to do. And I'm not going to finish that book because I'm a great writer. I'm going to finish it because I'm going to sit in that uncomfortable space until something comes. And I think we can all do that. You know, we can all exercise those muscles a little bit more. What's the next thing that innovators do better than the rest of us? They value their ideas. They treat them like they're important. Like I told you about Lloyd Winston Smith and the hot cold water thing. He was he had the, the tap on, right? And an idea started to come to him in the kitchen and his wife was there and she said something. And do you know what he said? As politely as he could, he said, shh. Because ideas only come around every now and again and his wife was there every day. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit mean today, you're still married, ever happy. But how many times have you had an idea and then the phone's run and you've answered it, then you've gone, oh, and it's gone. So many people have come up to me and said, you know that thing you have in the new invented the other day? Oh, I thought of that years ago. I go, good, and they go, ah. Ideas are like balloons. Blow them up as big as you can get before you judge them. Of course we have to judge them, but find out how good they can get uh, first. You know, it's not anyone can stamp on an unformed idea, on a new idea. Anyone can poke holes in it, yourself or your own idea or someone else's. It's not clever, it's not smart. Just get it as good as you can, grow it before you judge it. And try not to censor yourself when you're having ideas. I learned this from uh, one of my high school teachers and, uh, in year five, my English teacher. As we walked into class, he'd start yelling at us, right, right, right. Right! We'd all have to go to our desk and pull out pen and paper and just start writing. And, and you just said, write anything, it doesn't matter. Just don't censor yourself. Like the first thing that comes out, don't censor yourself, just write. Write for five minutes. Don't censor yourself, just write. We'd all write, we'd all write, write. And you pick one and you have to read it out. One day you pick my friend Nick. And Nick went, oh, it's not very good. He said, no, don't see, it's fine. We just read it out. He went, all right. He ran his hand up her warm thighs, searching for it. He goes, all right, you. You censor yourself the rest of the day. So, innovators think, they value their ideas, and they use them. They do something with them. An idea sitting between your ears isn't going to do much good for anyone, is it? You've got to take it out into the world. And that can obviously be intimidating because you might think, wait, I just put this idea of making things a little bit better, maybe in our school, maybe something that can be applied to lots of schools, but oh, 
think of all the things I've got to do, all the bureaucracy I've got to go through to get it through. You know, I, I just try not to think about all that. Just do the next thing. Work out what the next thing is. Just that. What's the next thing I need to do to find out whether this idea is any good? And just do that. So the next thing might be to draw it. Might be to might be to, to, to write it down. It might be to collaborate with someone you have skills you know to have. It might be to design. It might be to, to do a trial in, in your own school or even a little part of your own school. Whatever the next thing is, just do that. When you've done that, do the next thing. What we need to do is to find processes though. Like it's great to have lots of ideas, but then have processes to take 10 ideas and find out what the good ones are going Right? So you take 10 ideas, you don't back winners on hunches. You maybe devote, use your resources smartly because you don't have a lot to waste. Don't pick winners, just take 10 ideas and advance them all. Do it on a small scale, so don't do a trial all through the school. Just do it in one little part of the school, one classroom or one area of your school. Advance them all a step forward, then you might find out that three aren't going to make it. Then you can advance them all another step forward, you might find out that another three fall away until you find out which the one is that's going to make a sustainable benefit to your school. And there is, of course, a distinction between a bad idea or an idea that's not going to work and the poor execution of a good idea. Like, you know, WD 40? You know why it's called that? They had 40 goes. 40 goes. And you think after WD 22, the guy's boss would be going, you've had a good go at this. And after WD 34, he'd be going, you've got a lot of emails stacking up, mate. But they knew they had something good. Which makes me wonder a little bit about the Boeing 747. Um, <laughs> not to mention Motor 10. Like, what was wrong with Motor 6? Sometimes we need to be innovative in our own life. So I remember I started off by telling you how I'd become a corporate lawyer and I hated it. For the first time in my, in my life, I went through this process of thinking, valuing, and using, and I didn't even realise I was doing it. I thought, what do I really want to do? And I thought and thought, and I realised this idea of stand-up comedy kept coming back. I thought, I can't do that. It'd be hard, it'd be scary, what if people laugh at me? Wait, they're supposed to laugh at me, but what if they laugh at me? Cool, like because the idea kept coming back, I decided to give it some value to find out how big it could get. And that meant doing the next thing, using it. And that was simply to ring up the comedy store and put my name down to go have a go in the open mic one. But even though that didn't, I mean, a phone call was not that hard. That was the hardest step in the whole process for me. Because I, even though I'm going on stage, making that first phone call, I think because it was for the first time in my life, I was really taking responsibility for steering my life. And I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table and the phone was in front of me. And I stared at it for, you know, about an hour. Seriously, too scared to pick it up. And then eventually I, I couldn't. So I walked into the kitchen. There's a bottle of scotch in the cupboard. I opened it, had about four sweeps in there. And I rang up. But doing that, making that phone call, essentially changed everything for me and led to me being on radio and hosting new inventors and eventually being here today. So you might want to go through this process in your own school or even in your own life. Think, what are some areas that could do with a little less doing and more thinking? Maybe, maybe you've had some ideas, but you've, you've, you've not been confident enough to share them. Share them with someone you trust. And then use. Don't freak yourself out or intimidate yourself. Just do the next thing. So in the time I've got left, um, what I want to talk a little bit about is how we can create a culture that encourages everyone in it to be innovative and to step forward and share ideas. So again, it's going through this process of thinking, valuing, and using. How do you encourage your people to think? Well, I think the most important part of it is to make it clear it's part of the job. Now, I know teachers are busy and they've got lots of things they have to do, um, but you can make it clear to every one of them that part of their job <coughs> is to come up with better ways of doing things, either how they teach their class or in any aspect of the school administration. If you make it clear it's part of everyone's job, most people are empowered. By that, they don't think of it as an onerous extra task. They think, wow, they really want me to come up with ways of improving things. It's, 
That's fantastic. It's particularly good for new staff because they always walk into an organisation with fresh eyes and they are questioning things and asking why do we do things that way. And if you think it's important, act like it's important. Like remind people that you want to know if they can think of better ways of doing things. Remind them it's part of their job. Call them on it. Uh, when you do yearly reviews, you say, you know, your students are happy, the parents are happy, the marks are good, but you haven't come up with one idea in the last 12 months to help make this school better. And in 20 years, this school is going to be very different, and the only way we're going to get there to be a better school is if we all try and work out how that's going to happen. Value uh, people's ideas. So this is where, where big organisations fall down, fall, fall down. Like lots of big organisations, they have an anonymous email address. They say, yeah, we really want to hear your ideas, and email them to your idea at whatever company. And, and people go, well, I don't even know who that person is who's going to be sitting in judgment on my idea. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't think I will. You know, when, when people have new ideas for doing things better, they kind of feel, yeah, they kind of feel angry. They're like breaking things. No, they kind of feel excited and proud, but also, also sort of nervous and they're going to be judged and, you know, a bit defensive. It's a bit like having a baby, but less three-dimensional. Um, so pitch ideas to a person. You know, say, oh, pick a time of the week. You know, 3.30 on Wednesdays. Between 3.30 and 4, I'll be in my office, I'll be doing stuff. That's when I want you to pitch me new ideas. As soon as anyone walks in, you've got my full attention. You know, this is important. I really want to hear what you've got to say about how we can do things better in this school. And then when someone pitches you a really bad idea, what should you do? That's right, laugh at them, make them cry. No. No, thank people for bad ideas, right? You know, thank them for going to the effort of thinking of it and then having the courage to walk into your office. And don't judge them straight away. Go away for a couple of days and then come back and, uh, and give them some feedback about what you think the problems might be. Encourage them to think of more ideas or even ways to overcome the problems in this one. Because if you, if you go, well, that's stupid and that's clearly not going to work, not only will they be upset, they'll tell everyone, and then no one will come forward, right? They might tell the person who had a brilliant idea, oh, don't go and see, he's really cruel, he was cruel to me, and they didn't cry. And then, if people, if you're encouraging people to come up with ways of doing things better, you have to do something with them. You know, because if you, this I'm doing at the ABC, not with the current managing director, but another managing director, I, I bumped into uh, uh, some drink thing, I went, hey, I've got this great new idea, and I told him. It's about radio and TV producers swapping, you know, because TV producers are all know about vision, and radio producers know all about sound, but they're all bored because they've been doing for years. I thought, you know, why don't you swap them? Then the TV producers will know for six months, we can find out all about sound, and the radio producers will, you know, learn new skills and be excited again. Anyway, that's a great idea. And someone rang me the next day and said, yeah, the managing director said, da da da, so um, yeah, just tell me again, and da da da, and I never heard anything. Ever again. And that made me feel stuck here. If I have another idea, I'm not going to tell you. So if you're going to go through this process, you need to be accountable to what you do with people's ideas. And that doesn't mean you have to implement them all, because obviously that's impractical. It just means you need to be able to tell the, tell, uh, the person who had the idea what happened. You know, you need to say, we got to here, we went into some contestable thing, we could only do a trial of three, yours wasn't one of those three picked, but it's still in the, you know, we're going to do it again in six months and next time. Or, we came up against this problem, we couldn't get past it, it looked like you looked too hard, if you can think of a way around it. But you need to be accountable and find the end point of each idea. I mean, I, I said earlier on that I thought everyone was capable of coming up with ideas to do things better, and I really firmly believe that. And that means that everyone, if everyone isn't, it's a waste of resource, isn't it? It's like a factory working at half capacity. So the job of leaders and managers is to motivate people, to make it clear to people it's part of their job and motivate them to do it, and then to create systems and processes to enable it to happen. And I don't think you should confine really this process to schools, I mean, sorry, to teachers. Remember Samir Merchant Dunn, the 14 year old who worked out a way of saving his school uh, $24,000 a year. Why not involve students in coming up with better ways 
to improve the score. Now, of course, some will say, you know, let's just go to school four days a week and let's get more free periods or whatever. But if you spread that out over the entire student body, do you really think that you'll get nothing? Do you really think you won't get one idea that might be a way to improve the score? I very much doubt it. I mean, if that happens, let me know. But I bet you would get a couple of things that at least are worth thinking about and exploring ways to do things more efficiently, ways uh, of doing things better. When I... Um, well, this process does require a bit of commitment. <clears throat> and the other thing I did when I finished being a, a uh, corporate lawyer, I was doing sound comedy in life and I became a criminal lawyer. And I learned a lot about... I, learned, a lot about, I loved reading that. It was really interesting and fascinating. I learned a lot about commitment there. I was my first boss, was very committed, turned down promotions to go to head office. And I remember the first week he said, you just watch me in, uh, watch me in, in, in court and learn from me. I was watching him. He was doing a bail application for someone on his feet halfway through it. And the client from the dock, surrounded by two police officers, interrupted me. Hey, hey, so is that? And that, like, that doesn't happen often in court. They're usually quite solid places. He goes, excuse me. And he walks over and the guy beckons him in. He leans in, and the guy is kind of punched him in the face. <laughs> like, punched him in the face, he collapsed. Everyone was just in gas. You know, this is a court, right? So my wife staggers to his feet, sort of grovelly walks back to the bar table, looks up at the magistrate, wipes the blood from his nose, and goes, Your Worship, I've just received some further instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great example of commitment. I also learned about... <laughs> about the importance of also looking for opportunities to help each other and being aware of when, when we need help, being open to it, and then, and then you know, giving, giving other people as much assistance as they can. I learned that on getting up from a Samoan translator. There was a Samoan guy who was a little more than a boy, maybe 18 or 19, and he didn't have a lawyer, but he had a Samoan translator um, in court with him. And the magistrate was giving it to him both barrels of it. He said, you have been in front of this court six times in the past eight months, all alcohol-related offences. You've got high-range drink, driving, malicious damage, uh, theft, two assault charges, like pub brawl, minor things that still assault, and then back here for another, uh, another fight in the pub. And I said last time I was going to send you to jail if you didn't sort yourself out. I'm going to today, unless you can persuade me you understand you've got a problem with alcohol, and more importantly, you can tell me what you're going to do to fix it. So the Simone translator translated all of this, and the kid just looked up. And the minister's going, come on, I want to hear from you. You're going to jail. And he clearly had nothing. He was just totally overboard. Eventually, he sort of croaked out one word. And the Simone translator looked down, saw that there was nothing else coming, looked up at the magistrate and goes, Firstly, your worship, he wants to apologise to the court and his family. Secondly, he's put in place a six-point plan. <laughs> well, about five minutes. Then she's going, what's that woman? <laughs> that first boss I told, to, uh, I, I told you about, he was quite terse. One day he came into my office and he dropped a, uh, he dropped a file on my desk and he said, read, because, you know, read it would have taken too long. And there was a transcript from a uh, murder trial that we were acting on the appeal for. And I read it all. And, you know, I thought it was really focused and concentrating. I came up to a bit I didn't understand. And I finished reading it. And I went in and said, oh, I've just got one question. And he goes, yeah, good. yes, we have taken too long. I said, and I asked him the question, you know, about the bit I didn't understand. And he, and he said, oh, I'm not going to answer that question. I said, why not? He said, well, it's a stupid question. Said, why is it a stupid question? He goes, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Why not? Well, you go away and think about it. And so I went back to my office, wiped the tears from my eyes. <laughs> and I thought about it. And I thought about it. And eventually, I realised what it was, the student question. And I realised why it was a student question. I went back into his office and said, I've worked out why it was a student question because of this right now. But I learned two very important things from that. And that, and that is. The first is that sometimes when we think we're working really hard at full capacity, being really efficient, going and working as well as we can, we're not actually thinking very hard at all. And the second is that when we do take a moment to step back, remove ourselves from the busyness, or find a little bit of 
time to just let our minds go. Let them ruminate on things that usually the solutions to our problems are within the glass. A lot of people ask me how all the people on the inventors went financially. You know, whether they made money or not. And the truth is that some people made a lot of money, some people made a little, some people are sort of working in, you know, the business of the invention they created, some people lost a bit of money, some people lost a heck of a lot of money, and some had money before they came on the show. But I never met one person who regretted the, uh, the experience. And I think that's because, as I mentioned at the start, innovation has given us these relatively safe and comfortable lives. But one thing that means is that sometimes adventures today, in 2014, are a bit thin on the ground. And everyone who I met on the Inventors was involved in an adventure. The adventure of having an idea and then seeing if they can take it to the world, seeing how big it could get. And I firmly believe that that's an adventure that's available to all of us. And I'm sure you tell a similar thing to your students and you encourage them. But we've got to remember to have it ourselves. And I encourage you all to be involved in the adventure of ideas and seeing how big that can get. Thank you very much.